We are live at the National Press Club here in Washington, D.C. this morning as a group of conservative religious leaders will be discussing the upcoming Supreme Court cases dealing with same-sex marriage and their positions on those cases. This is hosted by Vision America. The Supreme Court hears oral argument next Tuesday over whether the 14th Amendment requires states to license marriages between two people who are of the same sex and whether states are required to recognize same-sex marriages performed in other states. This is live coverage on C-SPAN 2. And, uh, filming the uh, discussion today, so we want to uh, be conscious of uh, their presence and uh, appreciate the audience of C-SPAN. My name is Rick Scarborough. Uh, myself, along with uh, several others who are here, uh, most especially Matt Staber uh, and Deacon Keith Fournier, are the originators of the marriage pledge. These two lawyers uh, actually wrote the pledge. Uh, there are copies available for everyone. Uh, they were stacked outside, and we'll be glad to retrieve them if you'd like to see one. Have a website, uh, defendmarriage.org, uh, where you can both read the pledge, uh, see the uh, key signers. Uh, we now have, uh, as of yesterday morning, over 6,000 who have signed the pledge. Uh, we've been adding several hundred a day of late. Uh, and all of that uh, we'll be discussing in the course of the presentations today. Uh, we had two esteemed uh, members of the press conference who could not be here because of, you know, in one case, being out of the country. Uh, they both submitted a, a printed uh, copy of their position, and so I'm going to pass it around. One is Harry Jackson. Y'all can just scatter those around. Uh, he, Bishop Harry Jackson, I should say, of High Impact Leadership Coalition. He's a pastor right here in the D.C. area. Uh, another by Rabbi R.E.A. Sparrow, president of the uh, Caucus for America. We'll pass that around as well. If you're on it, the microphone can't hear. Excuse me. Uh, let me say that again in, in the microphone for those who are watching. Uh, but we're passing out two handouts, one by Bishop Harry Jackson, who is in Europe today, who wanted uh, to give you his perspective on this. He is a tremendous uh, black American leader, pastor of a local church right here in the D.C. area and a, a champion uh, for the cause of uh, Christ. And then also there's a handout going around by Rabbi Aryeh Sparrow. Uh, he is a, a rabbi out of New York City. Uh, he is president of uh, the American Caucus. And uh, you'll be able to see uh, his uh, remarks as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my name is Rick Scarborough. Our first presenter uh, will be Dr. James Dobson. Uh, he made a, a five-minute video presentation. We're going to show that to frame the debate today, and uh, then I'll be the first uh, visible presenter. Mark, help us. I'm James Dobson, and I appreciate you attending the press conference. I'm unable to be there myself today, but my colleagues have asked me to address you briefly by way of this video. Collectively, we want to express some profound concerns and beliefs about the decision the Supreme Court will soon render regarding the definition or redefinition of marriage. The institution of the family is one of the Creator's most marvelous and enduring gifts to humankind. It's been honored in law and custom for more than 5,000 years, and every civilization in history has been built upon it. It's been the bedrock of culture in Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, South America, Australia, and even Antarctica. Admittedly, there have been periods in history where homosexuality has flourished, including the biblical cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, in ancient Greece and during the Roman Empire. None of these civilizations survived. Only in the last few years has what has been called gay marriage been given equal status with biblical male-female unions. In fact, to date, only 18 countries in the world recognize the legitimacy of same-sex marriage. America appears to be on the verge now of being the number 19. God help us if we throw the divine plan for humankind on the ash heap of history. 
To put it succinctly, the institution of marriage represents the very foundation of human social order. Everything of value sits on that base. Institutions, governments, now prosperity, religious liberty, and the welfare of children all depend on its stability. When it is weakened or undermined, the entire superstructure can begin to wobble. And that's exactly what has happened during the last 45 years. The American people didn't demand the sea change that is occurring. In fact, the populations in 31 states voted one at a time on the definition of marriage. And every one of them affirmed it as being exclusively between one man and one woman. Those proclamations were ensconced in their state constitutions. Now, however, many of those popular elections are being overridden by imperious federal judges who are changing the course of history. In mid-2013, only 13 states had legalized same-sex marriage. Now, two years later, there are 37. And the Supreme Court seems poised to make it 50. Whatever happened to Abraham Lincoln's pronouncement in the Gettysburg Address that ours is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people? We make the decisions for ourselves. It's rapidly being replaced now by a government of the courts, by the courts, and for the courts. Let me get to the bottom line. If the U.S. Supreme Court de redefines marriage to include same-sex marriage, we all know, you and I all know, that this will not be the end of the matter. An avalanche of court cases will be filed on related issues that we can't even imagine today. We believe, or should I say, I believe, that religious liberty will be assaulted from every side. Indeed, that has already happened. Pastors may have to officiate at same-sex marriages, and they could be prohibited from preaching certain passages of Scripture. Those who refuse to comply will likely be threatened legally, and as the years go by, some will be subjected to prison sentences. Christians who operate businesses will be required to dance to the government's tune. We've all seen examples of photographers and bakeries and pizza parlors being required to serve at gay weddings, whether they want to or not, whether they have convictions about it or not. And they have to on penalty of closure or bankruptcy. Christian colleges may be unable to teach scriptural views of marriage and sexual relationships. Uh, accrediting bodies will tell them it's the law of the land, or so say some judges. I'm most concerned about what the courts will require of parents and their children. A few weeks ago, President Obama actually asked the legislators to prohibit parents from seeking professional therapy from state licensed counselors who would help their children deal with sexual identity crises. What business does this man have in telling parents how to help their confused and disoriented kids, especially those who may have been abused sexually? This is outrageous. In some states, counselors have already lost their licenses for trying to help troubled children in this way. Now, these and other concerns that I could list, my time is gone, um, are why we have called this press conference. The U.S. Constitution does not grant the judiciary the authority to interfere with religious liberties, with parental rights, and with the institutions of marriage and the family. Here we stand, and we will not go where the U.S. courts seek to take us.
Well, thank you, Dr. Jo Dobson. Uh, to all the esteemed members of the press that are here, we are very grateful for you taking time to cover something that is vitally important to us. Uh, we've already uh, made you aware of the uh, website, defendmarriage.org, of the handout that has the pledge on it. Uh, I'd like to uh, make you aware that we have now had somewhere over 6,000 sign that, uh, that pledge. Uh, I have uh, brought with me, uh, just for the sake of argument, uh, our example, uh, that it is no small number of people. That's uh, single-spaced, uh, over 100 pages of signatures that we would uh, like to draw your attention to. We believe that in time that it will grow into the hundreds of thousands, if not perhaps a million or more people in this country who will take the position that we have taken. Um, <clears throat> now, we understand uh, that America is a, a land of free thought. But in my remarks, I want to address the religious aspect of this, of this whole debate. I have uh, made copies for uh, those who would like a copy. I'll just pass these around. You'll have them. Um, and I want to read my remarks. Uh, and uh, by the way, at the end of the formal presentations, we're going to open up a time of Q&A. I want to begin by saying that I'm not here to offend or hurt homosexuals. I believe the vast majority of homosexuals in this country are like the vast majority of the rest of us. They simply want to be left alone to live their life accountable to the choices they make. But for three decades, there's been a concerted effort to normalize same-sex marriage in America. Driven by a propaganda campaign and promoted by activists in the homosexual community, aided and abetted by activist judges who make rather than interpret the law, Big business that has in large measure been bullied by threats of boycott or financial loss. Uh, liberal academia, liberal members of the press, and sadly members of the clergy in America who have exchanged biblical truth for heresy in their quest for cultural relevancy. Now the Supreme Court of the United States is about to de deliberate a matter that has been settled in heaven and affirmed in both God's holy scripture and God's created order. In 26 states, federal judges have overturned the vote of citizens who said no to same-sex marriage in landslide victories. Uh, in eight more states, the legislators passed laws allowing same-sex marriage without allowing the citizens to vote. In only three states have the citizens of that state voted for same-sex marriage. We have witnessed an attack on God and the, ver the veracity of his word unparalleled in American history. Judges, legislators, and citizens who voted for same-sex marriage have said, in effect, God and his word are incorrect on marriage. Perhaps unknowingly, they have chosen to deny God's word and observable nature and have created an illusion that most Americans approve of that which God forbids. I am not surprised that some recent polls have shown the majority of Americans now say they approve of same-sex marriage. We have heard a steady drumbeat for the past decade of a one-sided national discussion on the subject. But there, were al there was also a time when the majority of Americans in this country approved of, sames, uh, excuse me, of separate restrooms and separate classrooms for black American citizens. The majority often gets it wrong. And who wants to be labeled a bigot for declaring what their heart truly believes about sodomy and alternative lifestyles? Marriage can no more include same-sex couples than a rock can fall up. The court can no more redefine marriage than it can redefine gravity. Neither is, in, neither is in the court's legitimate jurisdiction. Today, I declare before heaven, I will not deny God nor his word to curry any man's favor. With great caution should anyone indulge the notion that one can change what God has said. We must remember who first conceived of marriage. To deny the created order is to attack God's very nature. His word is unequivocal. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male, a man. Female, a woman. He created them. Therefore, a man shall leave his father, a man, and his mother, a woman, and shall become united and cleave to his wife, a woman, and they shall be one flesh. Those passages are found in Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24. Marriage will always remain the union of a man and a woman for three reasons. Reason number one, 
God ordained marriage as a union between a man and a woman. Matthew 19.46 reads, Haven't you read? Jesus replied. At the beginning, the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man sh will leave his father and mother, and so be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Number two, the created order verifies what God's word says. The male and female are designed to be joined together and partner with God in the creation of another human being. Number three, the union of a man and a woman reveals a spiritual lesson. Jesus is presented in the New Testament as the bridegroom who is patiently awaiting the marriage supper during which he will be joined for eternity with his bride, the church. Marriage is a picture of that promise. Ephesians 5, 31 through 32 says it this way, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is very great, but I speak concerning the relation of, a man, of Christ and his church. Attempts to redefine marriage are a rejection of God and the Bible. The genius of America and religious freedom is, you don't have to accept or believe any of what I have just said. You can choose to embrace that God designed, you can choose to embrace that God designed men and women and that marriage illustrates spiritual truths, or you can reject all of that and make your own alternative truth. But you cannot change what God has spoken and verified in nature. Many have tried, and history documents their folly. In the past, stating such a position was known as practicing religious freedom and freedom of speech, both constitutionally protected rights, rights which of necessity will be sacrificed if the court approves same-sex marriage. To the members of the Supreme Court, I say, there are tens of thousands of people of faith, in fact, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, whose faith and conscience will not allow them to respect any decision that fundamentally rejects their God, His Word, and the natural order. If a majority of the court redefines marriage, thousands of Christians will respectfully refuse to acknowledge such a ruling has any jurisdiction over their lives. In the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King, we will view any attempt to enforce such a ruling as unjust, and our duty to the Constitution, more importantly, our duty to our God will force us to disrespect it. We will obey God rather than man. Our next presenter is an esteemed legal authority in this country. Uh, Matt, Matt Staver is uh, the founder and, and uh, chairman of Liberty Council. Uh, he's the former uh, head of Liberty uh, Law School in Lynchburg, Virginia. He's argued two cases before the Supreme Court and presented briefs in more than 35. Uh, Matt, you come. Thank you, Rick. Um, just for those that will come after me, I'll ask you to spell your names so that uh, for the media that they will be able to get that. So my name is Matt with one T, M-A-T-S-T-A-V-E-R-V as in Victor. I'm founder and chairman of Liberty Council, which is an international nonprofit litigation, education, and policy organization. We have offices in Florida, here in Washington, D.C., in Virginia, in California, and hundreds of affiliates around the country, and we also have a major presence in Israel. We are here because of the impending Supreme Court decision. This week, I released an article that I wrote in the stream, and you can read it at stream.org. Stream was recently founded by James Robison, who is with Life International, has an international ministry, and is the founder of The Stream, which is an online media publication. And in that article, I began talking about that in 2009, the Manhattan Declaration was signed, instituted by and inspired by the late Chuck Colson and co-drafted by Professors Robbie and Timothy George. And in that particular Manhattan Declaration, it ends with these words, and I'll quote, we will fully and ungrudgingly render to Caesar what is Caesar's, but under no circumstances will we render to Caesar what is God's. Five years later, that future is now here with the impending decision at the United States Supreme Court. 
As a result of what is about to take place before the High Court and with a decision expected by the end of June, uh, Deacon Keith Fournier, who will speak after me, a Christian Catholic, and me, an evangelical Christian, uh, began to co-draft this document that is called the Marriage Pledge. And we have circulated that among different leaders. Manhattan Declaration has over half a million signers. This one here has just been posted online, and every day hundreds and hundreds more are, are signing this. But we brought leaders together first. And we have leaders from a wide perspective of Catholics, evangelicals, uh, various Protestant denominations, Orthodox Christian, Jews, leaders from all around this country from various perspectives that don't agree on certain theological issues, but they are unified in this one area, and that is marriage is the union of a man and a woman, and on our watch we will not idly allow that to simply be deconstructed, because whenever it happens, we by experience and history have known that the government uses the police power to collide with religious freedom. That's what's happened in our country, it's happened around the world, and it's what will happen if we cross this line. So these leaders, as diverse as Franklin Graham and other uh, Orthodox pastors and clergies and priests, Jewish leaders have come together unified around this one issue, and that pledge is at defendmarriage.org, that we also have a copy of you here to, to uh, pass out. But I want to just touch on a couple of things within this pledge. One of the things that we are unified in is this. We affirm that marriage in the family has been inscribed by the divine architect into the natural created order. That marriage predates every civil government. It wasn't created by a legislative act nor by a referendum of the people. It predates every civil government and civil governments throughout the millennia of history have affirmed what is obvious and part of the natural created order marriage as the union of a man and woman. It wasn't confined to any particular religion. It's not created by religion. It's not a religious belief. Religion affirms that which is part of the natural created order, just as civil government affirms that which is part of the natural created order as much as it affirms gravity. You may not like gravity. You may prefer to be able to fly if you're able to jump off of a building or a cliff. But the fact is gravity is what gravity is, and you can Resist it, but it's there. It's part of the natural created order. The fact that there is part of our natural created order, humans as male and female coming together for not only unity, but procreation and having the best initial cell, the unit on which the rest of society is built to raise children and to produce those as productive citizens, that is the central structure of our humanity that transcends time, generations, and geography. It's not created by any civilization. It is part of our natural created order. And as such, we come to a letter from Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., when he wrote Letter from the Birmingham Jail. And Dr. King was asked a question, Dr. King, why do you respect some laws and other laws you don't respect? And he wrote in that famous letter, that there are two kinds of laws. There are just laws, and just laws are laws in which the earthly law is in conformity to a higher law principle. And there's unjust laws, and those are earthly laws that directly collide with higher law. Laws that are just, you have the obligation to obey those. Laws that are unjust, you have the duty to disobey those because he says, I agree with St. Augustine and Augustine, and other millennia of human history and the teachings of the Christian and Judeo-Christian church and, and history and scriptures that an unjust law is no law at all and it cannot be given respect as a law. There are certain small areas of life in which we encounter an unjust law. An unjust law is not a law that collides with denominational doctrines or just particular whims of society, but it's something that collides with the natural created order, or what we call natural law. And when we find one law like that, it really is no law at all. It is something that is in collision with the higher law principle. Neither the United States Supreme Court nor any civil government has the right or the authority to change the natural created order. Now, as We've seen in our United States Supreme Court a couple of different principles. Number one, the court has candidly stated that the only authority that it has in the, is in the confidence of the people. In 1992, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor wrote in the Planned Parenthood versus Casey decision 
As one of the justifications she gave for upholding the 1973 abortion decision of Roe versus Wade, and that is the self-preservation of the authority of the Supreme Court is at stake. Why? She said because unlike the executive, which has the figurative power of the sword, uh, and unlike the legislature that has the figurative power of the purse to pass laws, the judiciary has almost no authority to even enforce its own laws. It has to rely upon the other branches of government to do so. So the authority of the court rests not in the fact that it has the power of the figurative sword or the power of the figurative purse, but in the confidence of the people. And if they lose confidence in the people, they lose their authority. And therefore, she said, we took such a drastic shift in 1973 on abortion. If we now say we were wrong, the people will wonder, what are you doing? How can we trust you to make these major social shifts? And if we can't trust you, we then do not accord your decisions the weight that they ought to give a decision. And therefore, she says, as a means of self-preservation, even if Roe versus Wade was wrong, we can't deviate from it because we will lose the trust of the people and thus we will lose our own authority. That's a candid assessment, but it's an accurate assessment by Sandra Day O'Connor. The only authority this court or any court has is the fact that the people trust that it is doing its job consistent with the rule of law, interpreting the Constitution, the text, and being uh, adhering to the document that they are intending to interpret. Not that they are ideological individuals, trying to push social engineering onto the society based upon their own personal beliefs. Now, the Supreme Court has not always been right. And in about 230 cases, it's overruled itself, said that its previous decisions were wrong. Let me just look at two of those decisions that no one today will debate. In the 1800s, the Supreme Court, Justice Taney, a racist, bigoted judge of the Supreme Court, collided with Abraham Lincoln over the issue of slavery. And Dred Scott asked for his rights as a citizen, as a black American. He was denied those rights. And when the case went to this racist jurist, Justice Taney said, there's no justice for you at this high court because we believe that, quote, blacks are inferior human beings, close quote. How bigoted and racist and wrong was that decision? No one today will defend it. It's not the rule of law now. It's repudiated in everyone's mind today. And if it's not the rule of law now, it was not the rule of law the moment that Justice Taney pinned that decision. A second decision, 1927, Buck versus Bell, out of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Carrie Buck was a victim of the eugenics movement that was taking place around this country. Three previous generations of her family had low IQs. And so the Commonwealth of Virginia took Carrie Buck into a facility and they forcibly sterilized her. She sought justice before this high court. And instead of getting justice, she got an opinion from the famous Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who wrote the infamous decision of Buck versus Bell. No justice for you here at this high court, Carrie, because, quote, three generations of imbeciles are enough, close quote. Because she had low IQ in her generation, it was okay for the Commonwealth of Virginia to forcibly remove the undesirables among them. Well, unfortunately, that decision then spread like wildfire across this country, and the eugenics laws took place all over the United States, and it was picked up by a man by the name of Adolf Hitler, and it became the platform for his eugenics movement. And guess what? During the Nuremberg trials, when the Nazis were put on trial, what case did they cite to justify what the Nazis were doing? You're doing the same thing in America. It's called Buck versus Bell. How shameful that history is. No one today, no one will justify that decision as consistent with the rule of law. And if it was not the rule of law in everyone's minds now, if you were to ask them, then it wasn't the rule of law then. Those two decisions are examples of Supreme Court decisions that run contrary to the natural created order, to natural law, and they're no law at all now, and they were no law at all then, and frankly, we're now facing another one of those kinds of decisions before the United States Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court can't get this issue right, whether or not there is a constitutional right to same-sex marriage in the United States Constitution, if they cross this line and somehow invent some purported right to same-sex marriage in the United States Constitution, I say that, and the leaders that have signed this and many more that will sign this around this country, that we will consider and treat such a decision by the United States Supreme Court in the same way that we in history has viewed Dred Scott and Buck versus Bell. I say this with all due respect to this high court, to someone who argues before this court, 
That decision will be an unjust law, and we cannot and we will not give it the respect of the rule of law. That goes too far. That is a line that we cannot cross, not because we want a controversy. The last thing we want is a fight over this issue. We didn't pick this, but we know from history and experience, once a government seeks to redefine the natural created order of marriage, the first collision is with religious freedom, because this is a zero-sum game. This is an issue in which religious freedom is under attack. If the Chick-fil-A founder simply says, I believe in marriage as the union of a man and a woman, the mayor of D.C. and the mayor of this district of Columbia says, then you can't have Chick-fil-A's here in my city or my district, or they're getting kicked off of college campuses simply because the founder believes in marriage as the union of a man and a woman. Or, for example, if a photographer says, I don't discriminate against somebody because they're gay or lesbian, I photograph all kinds of clients and people, but I can't photograph an event any more than I don't discriminate against people who are Caucasian, but if they put on hoods and start burning crosses, I can't photograph that event either. And she's been told, no, if you don't photograph the event of same-sex marriage, if you don't participate in it and promote it, then you can't do photography. And Arlene's flowers or florist in out west, the 70-year-old lady has been friends with one of her clients for nine years, baked him cupcakes and cookies. Doesn't discriminate against him because he's gay, but one day he comes and says, I want you to uh, cater my wedding with another man. And she says, I'm sorry, uh, that is contrary to my religious beliefs. But there's another florist down the street can do a very good job for you. You would think that nine-year relationship would develop into respect and that person would say, I understand your conviction. I'll go down there, thank you very much, and continue to patronize that particular floors. But no, the civil complaint was filed and the Attorney General has come after her to bankrupt her personally and financially with her business as well. This is a zero-sum game. The reason why we cannot comply is because we know this will collide with religious freedom. And there are certain things that we cannot and therefore will not render to the state when they collide directly and unequivocally with what God requires of each and every one of us. So we stand united together in, in uh, this unity. I want to read the last sentence of this pledge. We stand united together in defense of marriage. Make no mistake about our resolve. While there are many things we can endure, redefining marriage is so fundamental to the natural created order and the common good that this is the line we must draw and one we cannot and will not cross. I want to bring up uh, Deacon Keith Fournier, and after that, Janet Boynes and E.W. Jackson. Deacon Keith Fournier, F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R, F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R, -E -E founder of Common Good Foundation and Common Good Alliance, and a Catholic clergyman. I'm also on the path toward the PhD in moral theology in my own church. It's my honor to stand with all of you, and it's my honor to be a part of this pledge. In fact, Pastor Rick, I don't know if dropping it was intentional, but it certainly is good optics, because I'm standing with thousands, and in fact, I'm standing with millions. And I'm standing in a 2,000-year history of the Christian church, reaching beyond that to Mount Sinai, going all the way back to the beginning of creation itself, in defending marriage as what it is, ontologically, to use a philosophical term, between one man and one woman, intended for life, open to life, and formative of family. And family is the first society. It's the first school. It's the first church. It's the first government. It's the first economy. It's the first mediating association. The entire social order is built on the family. And I stand fully within the tradition of my church, and in fact, the classical Christian tradition, in saying it is not just a religious position I'm espousing, but written in the natural moral law, as Matt so eloquently pointed out. A law that's written on the human heart and can be known through the exercise of reason. And we all know it, cross-culturally and across civilizations. Yet we do stand at a point in our history where nine black robe justices may decide that the natural moral law no longer has any standing in the jurisprudence of the United States. Once again, as Matt pointed out, they've been wrong before, 
And they would be wrong now if they did such a thing. I would only add to Buck versus Bell and Dred Scott the infamous decision of Roe versus Wade, with close to 60 million of our youngest neighbors now not with us. So I am honored to be a part of co-drafting this pledge and to stand with other Christians, other Jews, and people of faith, and people of goodwill in making it very clear, we will stand for marriage. And we will do all we can to ensure that marriage continues as what it is. I would only add one thing to what's been said so far. There is, in fact, a 2,000-year Christian history. And so I not only stand on these names, but on the shoulders of giants. And this is not the first time in this history that we have entered into a culture that has rejected the natural moral law, turned against God. What do we do as Christians? We do what Christians do. We try to infuse once again, like leaven in a loaf, that truth that elevates all humanity, no matter what their religious belief. So should the court make the wrong decision, not only will it be an unjust law, and Matt is absolutely correct, but it will be one which we cannot obey, just as the early apostles could not stop preaching. What will that mean? I don't know this. I don't know, but I do know this. God will triumph, and truth will triumph. And finally, in gratitude to my evangelical Protestant friends, my other Catholic friends, and Orthodox Christian friends, and Jewish friends, for having the courage to stand together. You know, there's a silver lining in this cloud, this dark cloud. We're being brought together. And not just to protect ourselves. This is not about protecting ourselves. But we love this nation. Not only am I a member of the clergy, but next year I'll have been married for 40 years. I have five grown children, and I just had the privilege of baptizing my seventh grandchild. I want the American experiment in ordered liberty to continue. Amen. And it was rooted by our founders in this very Christian tradition, a recognition that rights come from the Creator, and they're endowed, and they cannot be taken away by a civil government, be it a judiciary, a legislative branch, or even an executive. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Janet Boings, B-O-Y-N-E-S. I have a ministry that assists and help men and women leave the life of homosexuality. I'm based out of Minneapolis, and now I live in Texas. I also enjoy helping churches have a better understanding how we work with those that are in our churches that struggle. I believe in compassion without compromise. We're going to have compassion, but we're not going to compromise the gospel. I think far better than anyone who has lived the life of homosexuality have an understanding why the gay community do not want someone like myself around. Because we have the opportunity to debunk everything they're saying. Why don't you see me on CNN or Today or MSNBC or Good Morning America? because they have all the gays and lesbians on their show. But if I come on their show, I will tear down their belief system. And that's my goal, is to debunk everything that they're saying to be true when I know it's a lie. We have tragically watched our nation cave into homosexuality propaganda. More and more people are falling for the lie that homosexuals are born that way. Well, we know that's a lie anyway. Homosexuals have successfully made inroads into Hollywood, television, our children, public schools, universities, our government, the president of the United States, and now our churches. Homosexual marriage is growing in America. Reality, which is currently being litigated in our nation's Supreme Court as a potential federal civil right. But we know this is not a civil rights issue. See, the color of my skin is an immutable, unchangeable characteristic. I can't change from black to white. But I did live a homosexual life for 14 years. And I've been out 17. So we know change is possible through the power of Jesus Christ. If same-sex marriage becomes the law of the land, 
no one can even imagine or predict the ramifications that this decision will have. I know from personal experience that homosexuality is a false identity that is rooted in sexual or emotional brokenness. Same-sex marriage is a rejection of reality of God's design for how to raise our children. When we reject reality, we harm our children. See, I grew up in a family of seven kids, four different fathers. I understand what it's like not having a dad because of all those four fathers. No, them one was around. Every child deserves and wants a father and a mother. This is critically important to their sexual development. In the 14 years that I lived as a lesbian, I saw firsthand that there is no substitution for the role of a father and mother that they play in a child's life. Each parent offers a unique contribution to the health and well-being of our children. I know this to be true because when I was in a homosexual life with a woman who had two children, I tried to fulfill the role of a daddy. At that time, I realized I wasn't equipped or capable of being a father to these girls. More and more children, family members, and friends, those who were never predisposed to the homosexual before, are now experimenting sexually, trying out homosexuality, and becoming hooked. Those who seek help to leave the life of homosexuality may soon discover that there is no longer any help out there. Homosexual activists and their homosexual attorneys are pushing to ban any type of ministries, such as Janet Boyne's ministries, which help people exit homosexuality. Their goal is to indoctrinate our kids. Their goal is to silence us. Their greatest fear is men and women like myself who have walked away from that life. Soon, it may become illegal to even have this kind of ministry. Who knows how much longer we will have to do what we're doing today, unless we act now. We must be bold and allow ourselves, we must be bold and not allow ourselves to be forced out. We cannot lay down our religious freedom. I thought about what President Obama said in his inaugural speech. He said, you might not have vote for me, but I will be your president. Really, Mr. President? You have allowed gays and lesbians into the White House. You've sat down with them. You've had dinner with them. You heard their voices. But not once have you allowed those of us who walked out a life of homosexuality to come into the Oval Office, to come into the White House and hear our stories. I challenge you today to allow us to come and you listen to what we have to say. I pray that our courts will uphold traditional marriage so that God will continue to bless this great nation, the United States of America. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm honored to be here and, and thank you for the opportunity to take a stand with you, Dr. Scarborough, and with all of you, uh, a stand for marriage as we believe God ordained it. Uh, I stand here brokenhearted, frankly, because I never thought I'd see the day when in my beloved country, the United States of America, merely holding to a biblical worldview would subject you to ridicule, to fines, <clears throat> to punishment, uh, and yet that's where we've come. <clears throat> and so we're here not only to reaffirm our commitment to marriage as a union between one man and one woman, we're also here to defend the religious liberty of Christians and others all over this country who are simply trying to stand up for what we believe in. Yeah, it's important to, to remember, you know, Christians didn't invent marriage as a response to the gay rights movement. This is what we believe for the last 2,000 years. Uh, I believed this long before there was any such thing or I'd ever heard of any such thing as a gay rights movement. So the idea that this is something that uh, is motivated by bigotry, by hatred, well, who were we hated, hating before? Who were we bigoted against when we believed that marriage was a union between one man and one woman long before there was any such thing as a gay rights movement? 
So, you know, it, it breaks my heart that our country is going in the direction that it's going. It also breaks my heart that no matter how loving we try to be, no matter how reasonable we try to be, no matter how much we express, as one woman did when a, a gay customer came in and demanded that she provide, I think, a floral arrangement for a gay wedding, and she put her hands on his hands and, and said, I love you. You've been coming here for years, but I can't do that. She, she was still his friend. She still loved him. But he was asking her to break her commitment to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. People have to remember, Christians have died for our faith in him. We've died for our commitment for the word of God. So the idea that those of us who believe are simply going to roll over because there's social pressure, when we know that we follow a long line of heroes of the faith who have surrendered everything, including the 158 children, who just died not too long ago in Kenya, kids really, who would not renounce their faith in Jesus Christ under threat of beheading, under threat of murder. We're certainly not going to back up because people are upset with us. But we're not upset with them. We love them, we pray for them, uh, and we're gonna to continue to fight the good fight of faith. Two other quick points I wanna make. One is, I, I, frankly, I, I'm frustrated by, by this, this idea that homosexuality is likened and analogized to the black civil rights movement. Look, first of all, I, I can look around this room, some of you I know, but I don't know, uh, other than those that I know personally, I don't know who in here is gay and who is not. You know who's black in here. <laughs> and when somebody walks up to a hotel and says, I need an overnight stay, and you look at that person, and because of the color of their skin, you say no. When somebody goes up to get a drink of water and say, you can't use that water fountain, you're the wrong color. That is very different yeah. than a person saying, you want to come in my store and do business? Come on in. I don't care whether you're, you're homosexual or heterosexual. You want to buy dinner. Uh, you want me to make a floral arrangement. You want me to bake a cake. You want me to take photographs of your graduation, uh, your family reunion. No problem. But don't <coughs> ask me to do something that violates my faith. That's very different than what black people faced during the era of slavery and segregation. Uh, and it's not likened to interracial marriage because there is no biblical basis for denying two people of the same race the right to marry or the right to be together. Right. That was concocted to, to justify the subjugation of people on the basis of the color of their skin, to try to keep them in their place. But you won't find, as I've just pointed out to you, a 2,000 year history of prohibition against people of the same race, getting, of, of different races getting married. So you can't, the analogy is specious. And it's an insult to the illustrious history of the black civil rights movement to continue to use that analogy. But it's been very emotionally effective because people say, oh yeah, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be a discriminator. But these are two very different situations. And the last thing I'd say is this. I, I think we are facing an undermining of the very foundation of this country because it's founded in truth. The founding fathers said we hold these truths to be self-evident. You know, when Jesus faced Pontius Pilate and Pontius asked him, are you a king? Jesus said, I have come to bear witness to the truth. All who are of the truth hear my voice. Pilate said, what is truth? And I think that's the same question that's being asked now. What is truth? So who says marriage is a union between one man and one woman? I think that we are sowing the seeds of our internal destruction. Because if we are not a nation based on truth, if there are no overriding moral truths right. and everything is up for grabs, then might makes right. And the only thing that determines who's right and who's wrong is force. But that's not the kind of nation we've been. We believe that we answer to a higher authority. We believe that there were truths that nobody could change. We as Christians believe that marriage is one of those truths that can't be changed. Now people can talk about redefining it, but I will always believe that there's only one definition of a marriage, and no matter what they label any other kind of union, it'll never be a marriage. Maybe in the minds of those who do it, it will be, but it will never be a valid marriage because marriage was ordained by God, and it can only be one thing, a union between one man and one woman. You know, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet the scaffold sways the future. And behind the dim unknown stands God within the shadows, 
keeping watch over his own. I don't know what's going to happen to us for the stand that we're taking, but I think I can say for every one of us, we will give our lives standing for the truth. We will do it in love. We will do it in compassion, but we will be courageous about it, and we will never back down. We're going to bring uh, the people back up here that were sp spoke, and Janet and uh, Rick and Keith, if you could come back up, and if there's any questions. Yeah, go ahead. And yes, so Bishop E. W. Jackson. Uh, Bishop E. W. Jackson, J. A. C. K. S. O. N. Uh, and my name, for those watching, is Rick Scarborough. I'm the founder of Vision America, which can be found at visionamerica.org. All right, if there's any questions, uh, just two things that I wanted to just point out um, because it's a question that comes up. But um, the first thing is, is not as much a question that comes up, but as a policy matter, as a policy matter, same-sex marriage says that the highest level of government sends a message that children don't need moms and dads, that two women and two men are just an absolute equivalent of a mom and a dad. It forever deprives children of ever having the opportunity of a mother and a father. Heather recently wrote, and I think the article was in Federalist.org, uh, that she was raised in a home with two moms. Uh, she's now married to a man, has children, and uh, she says her heart ached when she was uh, in the home with her moms, and she loved her moms. She's not speaking evil against her mom, but she said she was deprived of a father, and she was never able to have that opportunity. And now that she is married and she sees her own husband interacting with her children, she realized exactly what she missed, and that's what Janet was talking about. The second thing is, what does this resistance look like? That's a common question. What does this line that we won't cross mean? And I think that it will be manifested in multiple different ways, just like the Civil Rights Movement was manifested in multiple ways. It may be a Rosa Parks who refused to get off a bus, or someone who sits at a counter that's segregated, or drinks at a water fountain that's a white-only water fountain. It manifests itself in different ways. But here, let me just give you one example. In 2004, when same-sex marriage came to Massachusetts, the Catholic charities that had been in the ministry for many decades, putting children in homes with moms and a dad, uh, they were told you can no longer do that. You have to put children in homes with same-sex couples. When they said that that violates our Christian beliefs and doctrine of the church, they were, said, they were told you then need to cease. To their credit, they would not compromise. They ceased. I say then and now that, number one, they should continue to pursue their call, which is to place children in homes with moms and dads, whether it be adoption or the florist or the photographer, whatever it might be. And number two, that they should not voluntarily cease, that they need to stand their ground. If the state chooses to use the police power of the state to come after them, then the state chooses. But we will not voluntarily cease, and we will not voluntarily compromise our calling and our commitment. That's what it means, that this is a line we cannot and will not cross. So if there's any questions. State your name, please, and who you're with. Is that working? All right. I'm Sarah Jones with Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but I will stick to one, um, namely that I keep hearing, not just today, but it's been an increasingly popular talking point that if same-sex marriage is indeed legalized in June, um, that pastors will be forced to officiate same-sex weddings, um, that they will be forbidden from preaching certain topics and may even end up in jail. However, not a single civil rights organization, including my employer or any of the LGBT rights organizations, has ever advocated this as a policy position. So where does this belief come from? What basis do you have for it? I can address that. I think when you elevate same-sex marriage to a protected civil rights status, what you cannot do legally with respect to race, you will not be able to do legally with respect to same-sex unions. So let me extrapolate that. Catholic churches can hire Catholics and Baptist churches can hire Baptists, but they can't hire white-only Baptists or white-only Catholics. The church might have a restroom but it cannot say that this is the white only restroom. I'm sorry, sir, this is the white only drinking fountain, the one for people of colors down the road. Bob Jones University had a policy that they later abandoned, but at the time they felt it was a biblically based policy and they no longer do, and they were correct in abandoning that policy that banned interracial dating. 
There was no law that banned interracial dating that said college campuses could not have such a policy. What there was was the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that banned discrimination on the basis of race. So the IRS came to Bob Jones University and they said, change your policy. They said, no, it's based on our biblical beliefs. They went to the United States Supreme Court and they lost that case and therefore they lost their taxism status. A facility in, in uh, New Jersey, a Methodist association, lost its property tax exemption over this. So this will have a wide-reaching ramification. Whether and when it will reach to the point of what a pastor can say, I don't know. We do know, however, that the bellwether of marriage for all of the world is the Netherlands, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. What happens there on marriage policy historically from anybody who studies family law then spreads to Europe and then to the United States of America. Same-sex unions first began worldwide in the Netherlands in around 1988, 1989. First time in the world history. We do know that a pastor in the Netherlands was jailed specifically for preaching on this issue. We know that pastors in Europe have been fined and also uh, targeted solely for preaching on the Bible with respect to this issue. We know that, for example, in Canada, you can't broadcast certain things that are critical of homosexuality. Now, we're not to that point. But it's not an, a wild hypothetical that this is, in fact, where we're going. Because where Denmark was and Norway and Sweden, we now are. Where Europe was in terms of the issues of uh, targeting people that are faith-based, we now are. It's just a matter of time. I'd like to add to that, not only as a constitutional lawyer, but even more as a Catholic clergyman, uh, the Hosanna Tabor uh, case has protected somewhat some of the challenges we're facing already in terms of hiring and firing in the Catholic Church. Uh, we certainly discriminate against no one, and we recognize that every single human person has fundamental human rights, including those who are self-professed as gay or lesbian. But there is going to be no changing what we have stood for for 2,000 years concerning marriage. Right now, we're dealing with struggles based on employing people who are in a purported marriage, men with men, women with women, and we cannot hire them because they are, in fact, violating the fundamental teaching of the Catholic Church. So far, Hosanna Tabor and the precedents that have come from that have, have given us some protection, but there is no question that Matt is correct. The police power of the state will follow any ruling right. that says that we must give an equal treatment legally to homosexual couples or to lesbian couples as we do to marriage. And if we do not do so, we will suffer the punitive implications. Now, that is not a scare tactic. We're already witnessing it. Right now, for example, I'm a clergyman, so I witness weddings in the Catholic Church. I do so as a civil authority, registered in Virginia, but also as a cleric. In Australia and in some other state, uh, nations, the church is beginning to look twice. Will they be able to do that any longer? We may not be able to do that any longer. We face the genuine specter of the state invading the church and telling us what we can and cannot preach and what our sacraments are about. That is a threat to fundamental religious freedom. We're about to lose our C-SPAN audience. I want to encourage everyone who's watched the, the, this broadcast, first place, thank you, C-SPAN. But number two, go to defendmarriage.org and let us know what you think about this pledge. Let, let me just come down. You've heard some of the legal analysis. Let me give some of the practical implications. When you make this a federal law, then the implications are profound. Churches don't only preach. They have bookstores. They have daycare programs. They do a whole series of other things. Now, if you start applying the law to these, these things that they do that you might not consider to be worship or strictly religious, then you impinge on that church's ability to do what it does. And if the standard is, well, you're a discriminator, then why wouldn't that be an implication? Maybe you ought to stop preaching that stuff from the pulpit. Uh, maybe you ought to stop talking about these things that are, are discriminatory and that are upsetting people. And the moment there is some sort of court order, a court case, in which an order is given that certain kinds of behavior cannot be engaged in because it's discriminatory, 
Well, and that pastor decides, well, you know what, I'm not obeying a court order that requires me to do this or that because that's a violation of my religious liberty and my Christian convictions. What happens when you violate a court order? Contempt and ultimately imprisonment. So there are a lot of practical implications to this that don't require we go to a point where there's a law that says a pastor may not preach uh, this particular truth. Uh, other questions? Yes, ma'am. You need a microphone? Sure. I am Jasmine Whittington with Capital News Service. Um, what would your response be to um, support, of gay, support, of gay, support of gay marriage or gay rights doesn't automatically mean that you agree with homosexuality. It means you support equality and humanity. What would your response be to that? Um, I can begin. I'm sure everyone else has a... That's a logical uh, statement. The reality of it is, is that that's not the agenda of this particular movement. The agenda is not just to make me silent and have my own particular viewpoint and discuss it among people of my community. The agenda is to make me participate, affirm, and promote it. For example, why was there such a big backlash against the founder of Chick-fil-A? Now what they want to do is force his business out. Why was the CEO that founded this uh, large uh, software company that was forced to resign as chairman of the board because he gave about a thousand dollar contribution or so to the Proposition 8 campaign multiple years before this? This agenda is a very intolerant agenda that is not content with the silence of those who object. This agenda is an agenda that wants you to participate and affirm. This agenda doesn't say, I understand the florist's conviction that I've been a patron of you, yours for nine years and we're good friends and, and you've known that I'm gay and I understand your heart. The agenda is, no, I want you, not the florist down here who can do a better job, because that's where their heart is, that's where their expertise is, but I want you to participate in my ceremony. I want you to participate in my KKK rally, even though you don't discriminate against white people. They want you to participate in a public affirmation of it. And so that's the critical difference, that crossing this line is different than Roe versus Wade in the sense that mm -hmm. you could have Roe versus Wade as horrible as it is to have genocide of that mass of nature. But up until now, you haven't been forced to participate and be a part of it and affirm it. This is not a decision by the Supreme Court where we stand on the sidelines, we criticize it, we groan about it, we complain about it, and we have our own view. Once it crosses that line, it fundamentally changes the landscape, it fundamentally changes the culture, and there is a coercive component of the state that targets anyone who objects. And in answer to the previous question, there was a an ordinance that was passed in Fayetteville, Arkansas. It went back on the uh, people gathered enough signatures to repeal it at the end of 2014. But it was the first ordinance in the country that actually had criminal penalties against churches uh, that refused to affirm uh, gender identity and same-sex sexual orientation, particularly in their hiring with people that were performing, quote, secular positions. That if you didn't Result, uh, you didn't resolve that within 30 days, it went into criminal prosecution. It's shocking. So this is not hypothetical that we're talking about up here. This is a forced participation in something that we cannot affirm. On that last point, that's the issue. And by the way, in the question, there's a distinction between recognizing equal rights and human rights for gay persons and lesbian persons, and then you moved on gay marriage. That's the issue here. To a classical Christian, be they Orthodox, Protestant, Evangelical, or Catholic, that's an oxymoron. There's no such thing. There can be lifelong choices between gay couples to live together, but marriage is what it is, and it cannot be changed. Right. Now, I'm going to add one last thing, and again, I'm the guy up here with a collar on. I mean, I will say as a Catholic, there's a theology to our sacraments, form, okay, and matter. 
for the sacrament of marriage, there needs to be a man and a woman who pledge their consent for life and are open to life. If, in fact, we're moving toward the redefinition of marriage and we put the police power of the state behind it, will there be compulsion for priests or deacons in the Catholic Church, just priests in the Eastern churches, to preside over these services? Now, our colleague from Americans United says there won't be. But we know from the trends of history, the police power follows the federal decisions. So it's incredibly important that we recognize the implications of this and make a difference. In my church, for example, we have a wonderful document by now Pope Emeritus Benedict from the 1990s on the pastoral care of, human per of homosexual persons. It's very tenderhearted, it's very pastoral, it's very respectful. But we will not and cannot recognize any such thing as marriage between anyone between, beside a man and a woman. And if the state tries to compel us to do so, we must and we will resist. Mayor? Look, I don't think anybody at this podium wants to see people denied the right to work, the right to live, the right to, to have housing. Uh, we respect the dignity of every human being. We, we don't hate anybody. Uh, but we believe what's really at work here is something far worse than, than mere coercion even to do something, but really to sort of bend your heart come into line if you want to be acceptable, if you don't want to be a bigot, you don't want to be a hater. And, and when you say gay rights, it sounds great, but my understanding is that every American has rights. So I, I'm not sure what gay rights means. We don't want to see anybody bullied. We don't want to see anybody beat up. We don't want to see anybody harassed. We don't want to see anybody hurt. You never find me calling a person who I know to be gay a name. Um, but we can't change our minds about the nature of the behavior. And I, and I think at bottom, that's what we're really being asked to do, that the whole culture is being asked to bow to this and say this is right and good and appropriate, and it's not. Rights for human beings, for American citizens, absolutely, we support them for all of us. But this concept of gay rights is is pregnant, frankly, with all kinds of political and social implications, which we simply can't agree with. I want to I want to tug on the hearts of you who disagree with us for just a moment. I want you to consider E. W. Jackson and myself are both pastors, and uh, the reason we're up here is not to win an argument, and not to hurt people. In my opening remarks, I said the vast majority of homosexuals just want to live and and answer to their choices, and that's what I want to do. But this step of the Supreme Court is the first of a series of steps that will be attended at. These two lawyers have articulated how that works. We're here to defend our right to preach an unfettered truth. We're here uh, to defend the right of all biblical preachers to speak to the issue of sin, but more importantly, offer the vehicle of salvation. And so it's a heart matter for us, driven by the, 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 the foundation of God's holy word. You may reject God's word. You may see no purpose in my, my calling, and I, that's quite all right. But don't deny me my First Amendment right to propagate the gospel, and don't force us to cut off what we believe to be the kind of answer that can change a young lady whose whole life has been tormented like a Jane, Janet Boyne's and offer them the solution that we believe is Jesus Christ. That is the foundation under, that underpins why I'm here today and why I will die if I have to for what I believe. You know, it's, it's real funny that we stand here and talk about the gay community and marriage. Do you know as many support marriage for the gays and uh, lifestyle? There's many that are in the gay lifestyle that don't support gay marriage. I have many that email me or on my Facebook and email me privately telling me to continue to make a stand, that they don't support it. But if they do voice their opinion, they're going to be blackballed. There's many in Hollywood that do not believe in marriage. Elsiana, what is the guy's name? Something in Gabbana? The designers. The designers. They shut that down, right? The uh, gay marriage and Ellen came after them, and 
everybody else came after them and shot them down, said, we're never going to buy your clothes. So that's what we're facing. So this is what I say to you. We're going to make a stand. We're not going back to slavery. That, that was many years ago. We have a voice today, and we will uphold what we believe is what the Lord had said, that marriage is between a man and a woman. I received death threats from the gay community. I received nasty emails, but they're saying I'm not the Christian. I have not targeted them. You can Google my name. You won't find one bad thing I said about the gay community. But so why do they continue to come after me? It's because we can debunk their belief system. They know change is possible. They know that they weren't born gay. But I believe in the last days. I believe Christ is going to return. I'm not surprised by what's happening out here. Matter of fact, I'm excited because I believe we're going to see Jesus soon. So we're going to continue our walk with Christ. We're going to continue to make a stand. And I'm blessed that we have all these folks behind me standing with us because I'm an example that people can change. I lived a lesbian life 14 years. I've been out 17. But I still believe in God for a husband. I have not dismissed that. And the day that I do get married, I'm going to shout it from the mountaintops. <laughs> I am so excited. For now, the Lord has me single. But before I die, I know I'll be married. And I'll be able to show people that you can have a nice marriage, a successful marriage. Now, God has healed me from the inside out. Change didn't happen overnight. This has been a process. But change is possible through the power of Jesus Christ. You know, we uh, are going to close the formal part of our press conference. Uh, none of us are going to hurry to leave. If you have a question, we're glad to entertain that. I thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to cover this important information. God bless you all. Elsie, on can you go get my book? Thank you so much.